Hi there. In the first video, an unsuspecting model kit was chopped up into pieces. To find out why, check out the previous episode. You can find the link in the description. Today, we're going to dress up the tail section a little bit. This is our starting point, and this is where we're going. There is no aftermarket available for this part of the kit, so we'll be using a wide variety of techniques, tools and materials to scratch build everything. Stay tuned and I'll show you every step of the way. I started with this joint on the tail fin. It has 10 recessed sections with a pair of bolts in each. I used the miter cutter to slice the siren strip into equal lengths. I needed a snug fit for the bits to stay in the groove until I secured them with some fast setting cement. Once the structure was complete, I sanded it flush with the surrounding surface. Then I punched out some 0.5mm plastic discs to imitate the bolts. Black polystyrene behaves exactly like its white and grey alternatives, but the visual contrast makes positioning small parts a lot easier. All I can tell you about the liquid I used in the toothpick to pick up the discs is that it definitely wasn't saliva. If someone was to try saliva though, they would find that it works exceptionally well. The finished joint is far from perfect, but if I may say so myself, it's still a thousand times better than what you get out of the box. Before we continue, let's step outside for a moment. Most Soviet aircraft are riddled with rivets and the Mi-2 is no exception. At first glance, I only noticed the round head rivets. Upon closer inspection though, I realized that the skin is held in place by a combination of round head and flush or countersunk rivets. The round head ones, which in the modeling world we often refer to as positive rivets, are very prominent even when looking at the helicopter from a distance. The flush ones though are barely visible, and because of this I decided to completely ignore them for this build. I didn't want to use decals for this process, so I opted for negative instead of raised rivet lines. I tested my wheels to see which ones produced the closest match to the lines that came with the kit. The wheels I ended up using both produced indentations somewhat too far apart for this scale, but this is the price I had to pay for a consistent look. And now, here comes the gist of 40 hours of work condensed into 69 seconds. Enjoy. Now, with the rivet detail applied, it was time to build a driveshaft fairing. In line with the limitations of the scale and my abilities, I decided to simplify things a bit and replicate the reinforcement plate underneath the driveshaft, some panel lines, access panels, hinges, as well as the bolts holding the fairing in place along the sides, and skip some of the more delicate details, which there are plenty of. First, I built a jig to keep the styrene strip straight and to be able to work its entire surface. Then I attached the strip and covered it in black ink to get a better idea of where I needed to sand. I ended up with a slightly crooked profile, so I detached the piece and sanded its base at an angle to counter for the error. Once I was happy with the overall shape, I moved on to the reinforcement plate the assembly was going to sit on. I applied two parallel rivet lines on a 0.3mm plastic sheet and sliced them off to create this strip. 
fairing was a bit longer than it needed to be, but I decided to deal with that later and instead glued the scratch built parts onto the tail boom. At the rear end of the fairing where it meets the fin, there is an additional plate that I wanted to reproduce using a thicker strip. I glued this on but something just didn't feel quite right. Then I realized that the fairing on the real thing extends over this plate, but at this point I wasn't gonna fix it because, I mean, who will notice this anyway? Well, guess who? I will. So, I got rid of the old one and carved a new, longer piece to replace the rear section of the fairing. It only took me two hours and it made me feel somewhat less awful. What type of undiagnosed mental disorder do you think I have? Let me know in the comments. Anyway, I marked out roughly where the excess panels were going to go and then the first thing I did was mess up again. The lines I engraved ended up being either unacceptably crooked or completely misaligned on the sides. So I filled them with some stretched sprue and used super thin cement to melt it into the grooves. I waited a couple of hours until the plastic hardened up again, cleaned up a bit and gave it another go. This attempt was more successful, so I deepened the panel lines with the scriber. This time I used some 2.5mm masking tape to mark out the location for the rest of the panels more precisely and follow the same procedure. I used a thin strip of self-adhesive label tape as a guide to add the horizontal lines where the hinges were going to go. After some scribing and cleaning up, I glued on some stressed through pieces of equal length to imitate the hinges. And now came the difficult part, the bolts. For these I needed extremely small discs, way beyond what my punch and die could produce. The best I could think of was to chop up some stress through and use that to imitate the bolt heads. I realized that I couldn't place the discs at uniform intervals along the fairing, because that way some would have ended up either in or too close to panel lines. So instead, I did my best to position these guys evenly within the boundaries of each individual panel. Needless to say, this was a very lengthy process and I hated every minute of it. But then again, remember, I'm doing this so you don't have to. I was just about to finish the port side when I realized that I forgot to add the bulge that's clearly visible towards the rear end of the fairing, so I sent it a piece of styrene strip to shape and glued it on. And there we have it, the new drive shaft was finally finished. Earlier, I had turned the backside of the fin into a complete mess by multiple unsuccessful attempts to add rivet detail and I just couldn't stand looking at it anymore. While I show you how I fixed it, I'd like to take a moment to ask for your support to grow the channel. If you find these videos useful or god forbid entertaining, please consider subscribing, sharing, liking, commenting, etc. Anything you can do to tickle the algorithm is greatly appreciated and helps me big time to get these videos recommended to more and more like-minded people. Now let's get back to the build. The back of the fin finally looked acceptable, but on its upper surface there were two access panels I wanted to add. Photo scribing templates are difficult to keep in place on curved surfaces, so instead I created my own oval templates and glued them onto the fin. Then I made my signature move and spilled a generous amount of cement on my cutting mat. Finally, I transferred the shape onto the piece and cut off the template. And now onto the gearbox. I focused on its riveted mounting base first. By the way, you may have already noticed, but I have no idea what any of these things are actually called. At any rate, I applied three rows of rivets onto a copper sheet. Then I used a piece of masking tape to measure the exact length I needed, after which I rolled the strip into a cylinder. I applied plenty of super glue to secure the cylinder firmly in place. To create the lip the gearbox assembly is bolted onto, I used styrene discs. 
The black one had a smaller diameter and was sandwiched between the outer discs to prevent them from melting together. After adding the bolt head, a piece of electric guitar string was inserted to reinforce the joint which the entire gearbox and rotor assembly was going to sit on. The actual gearbox casing in green I was going to carve out of a piece of styrene. I drilled a hole in the middle to prepare it for mounting and then temporarily glued it onto the same jig I used for the drive shaft. I like to use super glue instead of plastic cement for such temporary bonds because once the parts are ready to be removed from their handles, you can simply break them off. I bathed the casing in some debonder and then slid it onto the pin. From here onwards it was mostly a matter of adding more discs to represent various plates and to imitate the bolts holding them together. Some of these needed to be extremely tiny. Positioning would have been impossible without the high contrast between the black and white materials. The anti-collision light is located on the port side of the gearbox casing. The part that comes with the kit captures its shape more or less correctly, but it still needed some minor modifications. Mainly because I wanted to add the pin to strengthen the connection with the main part, plus I wanted to get rid of the molded on light bulb cover which was going to be replaced by a transparent one later. The real thing looks like it has a lid on top that comes off if you remove some screws on its side. In an attempt to add some similar looking detail, I glued a thin strip of 0.1mm styrene onto the side of the basket. I drilled a third hole for the electrical wiring that was going to be installed later. Once again, for the pin, I used a piece of electric guitar string which I like to use whenever I need more strength than that of copper or brass wires. By the way, this part is so tiny that I thought it best to leave it on the sprue for easier manipulation until it was ready to be attached to the main assembly. The basis of the tail rotor mass is a truncated cone, but it's more than that. There are six pieces carved out of its base to provide access to the bolts, while its other side ends in a hexagonal profile. The shape is so complex that I seriously considered sculpting it, but in the end, I used my rotary tool instead to turn a piece of sprue and give it a conical shape. I drilled through the center line of the piece so I could mount it on a hypodermic needle to ease handling. I needed a rock solid bond, so I roughened the needle up with a coarse sanding pad to give the glue a better surface to adhere to. To place the carve outs precisely, I used a saw to engrave an asterisk onto the base. Then I transferred the grooves over to the lateral surface. I used a 3 edged engraving tool to deepen the grooves and then refine the shape with a needle file and some folded sandpaper. I removed the excess and tested the fit. Then I punched out a hexagon from a thicker styrene sheet and temporarily glued it back on so I could drill through it. Once I attached it to the cone, the casing was ready. I wasn't sure about the diameter of the rotor hub base, so I made two Oreos, a larger and a smaller one. The larger turned out to be appropriately sized relative to the mass casing, so I got to eat the small one. It was hard to chew, but it tasted alright. I shortened the mast and mounted the sub-assembly onto the gearbox. As I was comparing the kit part to the scratch built one, I realized that I still needed to add a trapezoidal prism to imitate the box and the real thing the cables go into. Luckily, I had a leftover hex shape lying around I just needed to cut in half and attach to the top of the fin. Then, out of sheer cruelty, I inserted a plug in the bird's anal canal. I know, it's called cloaca. Cloaca. The tail section has a number of reinforcement plates installed that I wanted to recreate on this model, 
I started with the one that Tails Kit is normally attached to. I traced the relevant panel lines onto a piece of masking tape so I could design the parts on a flat surface. I like to use a toothpick to trace engraved details before I come in with the marker. Once I knew the dimensions and had a rough idea of the shapes I was going for, I transferred the designs over to a copper sheet and added some rivet detail using my double wheel. Old CDs are ideal for working with metal sheets because they provide more support than regular cutting mats and don't dull blades as fast as tiles or glass. I cut the part out, press it into a rolling set to give it the right curvature, rounded off the corners and attached it to the tail boom. On the underside there are two very similar looking, well, protrusions for the lack of a better term. I'm not sure if these are access panels for maintenance or if they contain equipment. If you happen to know, let us know in the comments. I produced these details using the exact same techniques as before. I applied plenty of super glue to secure the plates in place. Capillary action sucks some of the glue underneath the part which will prevent washes from doing the same during the painting phase. Once the glue was dry, I cleaned off the excess with the bonder. The base was made of black styrene. Its corners were trimmed and rounded off and the part was curved and glued onto the copper plate. Kicker and debonder were used to speed up the curing process and clean off the excess respectively. Finally, I added the boxes which were created in a similar manner. I poked a few holes onto the lid to represent some of the bolts. And there we have it, the excess panels, or whatever these things are, finished. Next came the tail skids mounting points. You will recognize all the steps from before. I used a brass sheet to create the fork the skid's shock absorber is attached to on the real thing. Brass is much harder than copper which makes it more difficult to work with, but more durable when it comes to retaining its shape. As a consequence of shortening the tail boom in the previous video, the vertical stabilizers had to be moved further back. I like to use plastic sprues for these kinds of touch-ups. I wanted to install a housing for the axle, because without it, it's difficult to get the stabilizer's angles right. I slid a piece of hypodermic needle into another one of a larger diameter, so the guitar string I was going to utilize as an axle will fit tightly without any wiggle room. I used some masking liquid to temporarily attach the housing onto a string to help with the installation. Then I buried the housing under a coat of super glue, and once dry, I used a sharpened string to remove any residue from inside the tube. Then I cleaned up the surface and moved on to the actual stabilizers. I solemnly swear that at this point I didn't want to complicate things any further. In fact, I even added an axle to the kit part so I could glue it in place after painting. But the more I looked at the original stabilizers, the more uneasy I felt about the kit part's stupid, toy-like shape and simplified details. So once again, I embarked on a journey into the unknown. Not only did I need to design new stabilizers, but I wanted to make sure that the axle is perfectly perpendicular to the length of the aircraft. Rather than attempting to drill holes at the right angle, it seemed like a good idea to bury the axles inside the plastic while the part was still flat. I needed extreme precision here, because the surface details on one side needed to be transferred over to the other side and even a tenth of a millimeter could ruin the overall look. This is also why I made four stabilizers instead of just two. I knew I was going to mess at least one up. Inks have a tendency to fade with handling due to exposure to the sweat and oils on our hands, so I decided to engrave the lines I needed first, and then use ink from a marker as a wash to see what I was doing. I trimmed off much of the excess plastic and used a surgical blade to mark some of the key reference points so I could repeat the design process on the other side. After some more trimming and sanding, the outline of two pairs of stabilizers appeared. The overall shape was okay, but the leading edge still needed to be rounded off and the trailing edge had to be thinned. I separated the parts and carefully cleaned them up. I was almost there, but two distinctive features were still missing. 
the triangular plate at the base of the stabilizer and the ring on its outer edge. Once again, I have no idea, but if I had to guess what the ring was for, I would say that it probably served as a mounting point for certain aerial cable configurations. I made these parts exactly the same way as all the other copper details shown earlier. Two further reinforcement plates were also missing. Note the difference in shape between the starboard and the port sides. I used some of the leftover riveted copper to make these parts and I attached them with super glue. Although I feel like I didn't get the shape exactly right, at this point I felt quite happy with the results and thought that replacing the kit part was well worth the hassle. But I'd rather let you be the judge of that. The Hobby Boss kit doesn't include the dual blade antenna, which is a pity because it's one of the MI2's most characteristic features. I thought about starting with the reinforcement plate at its base, but then I noticed the Nexus panel I hadn't installed yet. The way I usually position such details is I apply some super glue on the surface and gently slide the part over it. Once in place, I press down on the detail and add more glue to the sides. Then I use the kicker debonder combo for curing and cleanup. This time I needed the bond to be very solid because I had to drill through both the plate and the plastic to get holes I could slide the antennas into. For the blades I was going to use styrene strips again. I guesstimated and cut off the required length based on my photos as I had lost all faith in scale drawings. I pulled out the thinnest guitar string and drill that I could find and got to work. Once the string was securely logged inside the plastic, I began to thin the piece. If you think this process doesn't look much fun, you aren't wrong. All of it was absolutely disgusting, but this was the best I could come up with. With that being said, I was happy with how things turned out in the end. And the best part was that the blades were removable, so at least in theory, there was a chance of me not breaking them off by accident. It was time to add the electrical wiring, the position light, and this oval lit thingy. I started with the lid. All I did was slice discs of styrene rods of different diameters at a 45 degree angle, glued them onto the back of the fin, poked and drilled through the middle, and engraved the groove for the wires with a needle file. And with that, the lid was now off my to-do list. One of the most useful household objects for modelers is a cotton swab, or at least it used to be. Nowadays the shafts are made of paper or wood. Back in the day, they used to be made of plastic, which allowed modelers to stretch them into microtubes. Who would have thought that a creature as tiny and innocent as a seahorse would be capable of ruining this for all of us? Anyway, luckily I still had some left in my stash, which allowed me to tie some 0.1mm wires together, just like the real thing. When it comes to imitating cables and wiring, I like to work backwards from the device towards the power source. You never know the exact length of wire you'll need for any particular job until the very last moment, and it's easier to make tiny adjustments in more out-of-size spots. As a last step, I added a piece of hypodermic needle to imitate the housing of the position light. And that's all the electrical wiring done on the fin. Next up, the tail rotor. The rotor hub on the real thing is full of yummy details, but the kit part doesn't do it justice. I mean, hobby boss have molded on some detail, but I wouldn't even call it a simplification. It's just random stuff to make it look busy, which meant that all of it had to go. The rotor was at least spinning alright. I had to verify that because I'm 7. So I trimmed the details of the hub and scraped it as uniform as I could. Then I mounted the rotor on a hypodermic needle I had previously removed the tip of. I thinned the edges, especially the trailing one, to get the profile right. The blades were too long, so I used the miter cutter to shorten them equally. Now that the basic dimensions and shapes were acceptable, I moved on to detailing the hub. I used super thin cement throughout the entire process. I'm hoping that the footage here speaks for itself, but I wouldn't be able to add much even if I wanted to, as I have no clue what any of these parts are called. 
popsicle shaped part in green which I added previously, I suspect, is the socket for the cables feeding electricity to the de-icer system located on the blade. The other detail in red is so tiny that I needed to think of a plan to be able to handle the part while building it. I combined some 0.5mm copper wire with styrene and some leftover microtubes. Then I gave the tips of the blades their final, curved shape, and that was it. At this point I felt like the tail rotor had at least some resemblance to the original. Now onto the tail skid aka tail rotor guard. Like the name suggests, the purpose of this device is to prevent the tail rotor from hitting the ground. It consists of a Y-shaped piece supported by a shock absorber. The kit part is more like a chunky stethoscope. Too thick, too simplified, plus the shape is all wrong. So I took out some electric guitar string and kept bending it until I got the Y shape I was looking for. The strings are much more difficult to manipulate than most wires because of their tendency to bounce back. Once you get them to the required shape though, strings are much better at retaining it than other materials. To fill the gap in the middle, I used a soldering iron. My photo edge bending tool came in handy to bend this kit one last time, then I checked the fit and cut off the excess string using a rotary tool. I wanted to keep the tail skid removable to ease the painting process, so I glued on two short pieces of tube I could slide the assembly in and out of. The tubes made the attachment points oversized, but at this point I decided that this was something I could live with. For the shock absorber I used a smaller gauge string and wrapped some wire around it to simulate its ripped rubber casing. Then I created a tiny fork from brass I could attach the shock absorber to. If you think, what are the chances of getting this right the first time, I'm gonna let you in on a dirty little secret. Even the one I consider final is not perfectly accurate, but it's good enough not to ruin the overall illusion of scale like the kit part would. As I was browsing my photos, I noticed a number of rings on the tail boom, which I suspect could also be there for alternative aerial cable configurations. For now, I decided to only add their bases, which meant gluing some styrene rectangles onto the tail and add the rings after painting. If I'll still remember to do so, that is. This proved to be a good cool-off exercise to end this tale. While there are a number of things I would do differently the second time around, overall I was quite satisfied with the result, but I'm hoping you found something useful or at least entertaining on this journey. And with that, dear friends, it's time for me to shut up and let you get on with your own builds. If you like this video, consider subscribing, sharing it with others, liking, commenting, etc. In the next episode, we'll be working on the forward fuselage, so we'll finally be putting some meat on the bone. I hope to see you soon. Loaga.